on in. Settle back. It's curtain time at the Story Lane Theater. You've never seen a stage like this one. Anything can happen here. Today we're going to watch the story of Finn McCool, Ireland's most famous giant. We'll visit Finn's home on Knockmany Hill and watch as Finn and his wife Una prepare to do battle with the powerful and terrifying giant Cucullin. But before we see the story, let's share a few moments with two of the musicians who perform the music you'll be hearing in the show. The man playing the tin whistle is an Irish musician named Cathal McConnell. And the man playing the accordion is Dave Richardson, who comes from England. They both travel all over the world, performing with a group called the Boys of the Lock. Let's hear Cathal and Dave tell us more about their music. Got my musical interest from my father, no doubt about that. My father was called Sandy McConnell. He was a good singer. He played the whistle, and in his younger days he played the accordion. When um, my father got me a little tin whistle for Christmas, it seemed that the, the whistle was the right instrument for me to play. If you look at music in, in any culture, music is a way of communication. It's, it's a way of expressing ideas or emotions. And uh, lots of people like to listen to music because it reflects things that they feel or things that they think. If we look at Irish music uh, as we see it now, or as we hear it, it's been handed down for hundreds of years, and it's still in very good condition. I think this is because people in Ireland continue to live, many of them, in the country, and the old ways survive, the old ways of meeting with one another and talking to one another, playing music together. I first heard the story of Finn McCool from my mother. It's a dramatic sort of story. It's a story of the impending battle of the two giants. It's a bit of a challenge, um, putting music to a story, because you really have to think about it. We tried to decide what kind of music w would fit these characters to support the, the story that was being told. We think about the bad guy, Kukulin, and we think of dark, heavy, sinister music for him, and, and we thought of maybe using very low notes on the instruments. We used a little instrument called an accordion and used the bass on it. He looks dark, menacing. You wouldn't want him coming to your birthday party. He's the guy who'd steal all the cookies. For Finn, we wanted something a bit more light and comical. He looks like he'd be a lot of fun. And uh, at the same time, he doesn't look too street smart. I think he misses one or two things in life. So we decided to use lighter instruments, like the tin whistle. The wife of Finn, Una, is a very good friend to Finn. She's his best friend, that's why he married her. She's a very busy woman, active, happy, she's very content. So we chose light instruments and very light rhythms like the jig and the polka. This business of writing tunes is unusual. You don't actually take out a pen and paper and write them. You sit with an instrument in your hand and your fingers on the instrument and you move your fingers around and suddenly a little piece of melody catches your ear and you think I like that, that's the start of an idea and then it might all click together, you know, it's just like making up a little poem or something. Playing this music gives a lot of pleasure to a lot of people. As time goes on it's, it's been played more and more there are an awful lot of young people learning this music now, much more so than when I was young. 
It's very interesting to, to think about what we get from music as people. I think it reminds us of how much like other people we are. They can be people in other countries in the world or they can be people who lived in the past. They can play you a tune or sing you a song, let you hear a melody, and you know that they're the same kind of person as you. And now, here come the sounds and sights of Finn McCool. was the most famous champion Ireland ever knew. Finn was a giant to be sure, but when he was born, he was no bigger than a fire-breathing dragon. And as giants went in those days, that was a mite on the wee side. Now King Cool was Finn's father. And being a famous Irish giant himself, he took the lad's small size to heart. I have a boil on me flank that's bigger than he is, said King Cool on seeing the boy for the first time. King Cool was so distraught over Finn's size that he took the child to the castle parapet, wiped the potato-sized tears from his eyes, and gently punted him into the lock below. Now the grandmother of the lad, King Cool's mother, just happened to be on the shore watching as the infant plunged into the water. Why, that's me own flesh and blood splashing about there, she said, and immediately dove in. In two shakes of a lamb's tail, she dragged the child out of the lock and rushed away with him deep into the woods. Finding a nice stout tree, the grand dame took out her hatchet and chopped a chamber within it. And there the two of them lived. For years the old woman lovingly fed Finn a diet of tree bark, peat, and the occasional grub. But the child thrived nonetheless. After some time, the boy rather outgrew his surroundings, and it was then that his grandmother knew it was time to send him out into the wild and cruel world. Now, such an inauspicious beginning to a life has been known to spoil a man's disposition entirely, but not young Finn. He thanked his grandmother for looking after him, kissed her gently upon the head, and set out to distinguish himself as a great hero. Why, he was as strong as two dozen oxen, and as swift as 43 hares. And he trekked all over the emerald countryside, taking a glen at a step, a hill at a leap, and locks at a bound. Before too long, Finn took a wife for himself, and her name was Una. Una was a beauty, as they say, and a giantess herself. Aye, and that sun-kissed lass was a clever one, too. They were a matched pair, they were, with Finn's brawn and Una's brain. Together they lived quite happily upon the top of Knockmany Hill in Ulster. People always wondered why it was that Finn had selected such a windy spot for his dwelling. Now, Finn made his share of excuses for choosing to live in the middle of nowhere, but the real reason Finn made his home atop Knockmany was to see Cucullin 
kommen. Oh, Cacolan, it sends shivers down me spine to even utter the name. Cacolan. No other giant in all of Ireland could stand before him. It was said, and I personally know for a fact is true, that by a single blow of his fist, he once flattened a thunderbolt into the shape of a pancake. He always carried it about with him in his pocket. And before he got into a fight with one of his foes, Cucullin would show them the pancake, just to give them a notion of the kind of pulp they were about to receive. Cucullin had given every giant in Ire considerable tarring, everyone of course but Finn himself. But that was only owing to the fact that whenever Cucullin went after Finn, our hero would run in the opposite direction. Now at this time Finn was building the causeway from Ireland to Scotland. It was a grand undertaking, even for Finn, so he had his band of champions called the Fenians assisting him. One day down at the causeway, Finn and his men were rearranging the coast and, and moving a few small cliffs when he began gnawing upon his thumb. You see, this is how Finn called upon his singular gift for prophecy. Whenever he got into a fix and he couldn't fathom the choices that life so often presents, he would suck his thumb for inspiration and a most curious thing would occur. He would see the future before him as clear as day. For it was in his thumb that his power for prophecy resided. Now at that precise moment, Finn had divined from his thumb that Cucullin was coming to the causeway to do battle with him. And it was just then that Finn discovered a very warm and sudden fit of affection for his wife. I need to see me love an Erna, said Finn. My thumb tells me so. Me think she's in danger. But Finn, pleaded Conan the Bald, one of the Fenians, what about the causeway? Alas, it was no use. Finn was already well on his way to knock many. God save all here! Musha Finn, said his wife. Welcome home to your own Una, you darling bully. And what brought you home so soon, Finn? Why, my sweet Rose, nothing but the purest of love and affection for ye, of course. After Finn spoke, he clapped his thumb into his mouth. Finn, sweetness, said Una, please don't do that while you're talking to me. It's not polite. He's a-coming, said Finn. I see him below Dungannon. Who's coming, said Una? Who are you talking about? It's that nasty cuckoo it is. Oh, oh, it's said that when he gets angry and begins to stamp, a dozen earthquakes erupt. And when he does battle with thunderbolts, he flattens them into tiny pancakes and then eats them with honey, a whole hive of it, and with the bees still buzzing inside it. Gracious, the brute, said Una. I don't know how I'll manage. If I run away again, I'll be disgraced before me people. And me thumb tells me that I must meet him sooner or later. Well, my bully, don't be downcast, said Una. Leave it to me and I'll bring you out of this scrape better than you might on your own. Now, it so happened that Una had a sister named Granua who lived upon a hill called Cullamore just opposite Knockmany. The beautiful valley that separated the two sisters was only four miles wide, and so on a summer's evening when they wanted to talk, Una and Granua only had to put their heads out the windows of their homes. Granua, are you home? said Una. I am, sister dear, said Granua. And how have you been today? Well, not so well, I'm afraid, said Una. Would you do us the favor of looking about from your window and telling us what you see? Why, nothing, sister dear. Tis only a mountain coming over this way, said Granua. Nothing to trouble yourselves over. A mountain? That's no mountain, said Una. That's the giant Cacullin and he's coming to leather our fin. Perhaps if you delay the brute, it'll give me a moment to think. Why don't you ask him up for a bite? I only have fifty pounds of butter, and it's not nearly enough to make a cake for that giant, said Granua. If you toss me over a ton or two, you'll oblige me very much. So Una got the largest tub of butter she had and called up to her sister. Granua, 
Are you ready? said Una. I'm going to throw now. Una gave the butter a mighty heave, but in her anxiety over Cucullin, she forgot to say the magic words that were to make it fly to Granua. And so the butter landed with a thud halfway between the two hills. My curse upon you, baleful butter, cried Una. You've disgraced me. And with that said, the butter turned instantly to stone. It lies there today exactly as it came out of Una's hand, with the mark of a four fingers and thumb imprinted upon it. Oh, never mind, said Granua. I'll do the best I can to stall Cucullin. So Granua baked her cake anyway and signaled Cucullin to come up to Cullimore. She placed the cake before the giant, and without so much as a thank ye, miss, Cucullin threw it into his mouth and devoured it in one frightening bite. Needs butter, he grunted, licking the last crumbs from his fingers and proceeded on his way. In the meantime, Finn was in quite a panic on Knockmany. Una, can you do nothing for me? Where's all your invention, woman? Will I be skivered like a rabbit before your eyes and have me name disgraced forever before all of Ireland? How can I fight a man who scares the fire out of thunderbolts? There now be easy, Finn, replied Una. I've got an idea. Just leave it to me. With that, Una went to work. First, she rummaged about and found 21 iron griddles. Then she took the griddles and kneaded them into the middle of six loaves of bread. She then baked the loaves on the fire, setting them aside in the cupboard when they were done. Finally, Una took a large pot of new milk, which she made into curds and whey, and then whispered something into Finn's ear. And just as Cucullin was coming across the valley, Una fetched a baby's cradle and instructed Finn to lie down in it. Say nothing and follow me lead. I will, but I don't like it one bit. Just as he was getting settled, Cucullin burst through the door. Be this the home of the great Finn McCool? He asked. Aye, it is indeed, said Una, but he's not in at the moment. Someone told him that a big bassoon of a giant called Cucullin was down at the causeway looking for him, so he rushed away to catch him. Can I help ye? I am Cucullin, said he, looking puzzled. And I've been after your husband for twelve months. Una let out a loud, mocking laugh <laughs> and looked at him as if he was only a little pip of a man. If you take my advice, you poor looking creature, you'll pray day and night that you may never see him, said Una. It'll be a black day for you if you do. Hop! <laughs> snorted Cucullin, dismissing Una's warning. Ah, now the wind's blowing against the dar, said Una. Seeing as how Finn is away from home, would you be civil enough to turn the house around? Now, this request took Cucullin aback, for even he didn't do this sort of task on a daily basis. Nevertheless, he pulled the little finger of his right hand three times and went outside. He then put his massive arms about the house and with some effort turned it in a position favorable to the wind. Thank ye kindly, said Una. Uh, please stay and have a bit of me humble fare. Even though you and Finn are enemies, he would scorn me if I didn't treat you kindly in his own home. Una brought Cucullin to the table and placed before him the half dozen loaves of bread she had baked, together with ten sides of bacon and a stack of steaming cabbage. Cucullin greedily stuffed one of the loaves into his mouth and took a tremendous bite. When Cucullin's teeth struck the griddle that lay in the middle of the loaf, the entire house shook. Oh, blood and fury, shouted Cucullin. And just what sort of bread is this you've given me, I might ask? What's the matter? said Una. Matter? shouted Cucullin. Why, what's the matter indeed? Here are the two best teeth in my head smashed to smithereens. Oh, it's a pity that I forgot to tell you that nobody but Finn himself can eat it, and his little mite who sleeps in the cradle over there. Take your bread away, or I'll not have another tooth in my head. 
Now, now, said Una, don't be waking the child with all your belly aching. Then Finn gave a shriek that startled the giant. <coughs> now you've gone and done it, you've awakened him, said Una. Ma, said he, I'm hungry and I want something to eat. Una went to the cradle and gave Finn one of the loaves of bread that had no griddle in it. After a few bites, he realized it was safe and made the rest of the loaf disappear in two bites. Cucullin was thunderstruck, and by the look on his face, Una knew her plan was working. I'd like to have a look at the lad in the cradle, said Cucullin. Any child who can manage that bird is in good fighting trim. Get up and say hello to our guest, me lamb, said Una, motioning to Finn. It's terribly shy when company comes. Not many travellers get up our way, you know. Finn crawled out of the cradle and toddled over to Cucullin. Are you strong as me, da? What a booming voice and such a young babe. Just a touch of the whooping cough, Una explained with a smile. Then Finn grabbed a white stone and handed it to Cucullin. Can you squeeze water out of this white stone? said Finn. Now Cucullin was puzzled. But as he intended to humor the lad, he took the stone and squeezed it as hard as he could. But it was no use. He might be able to turn the house around or flatten a thunderbolt into a pancake, but squeezing water out of a rock was something else entirely. You call yourself a giant? Me da can do it, and he has showed me how. Give me that stone. Finn took the stone from Cucullin and then slyly exchanged it with the curds, just as Una had instructed. And he then squeezed the curds until the whey squirted out in a little shower from his hand, clear as water. I don't care to waste my time with a giant the likes of you. You'd better be out of here before me dog comes back, or else he'll make porridge of you and serve you for dinner. Now, Cucullin was taken quite aback. He's a lucky man, to be sure, to have such a handsome wife and a son who snacks on iron and squeezes water from dry stones. I see I have misjudged him terribly. If it's all the same to ye, I think I'll stay a bit for Finn's return. It would do me proud to make the acquaintance of a great hero such as he, and I shall have to apologize for chasing him hither and yonder for all these months. Yes, apologize I must, even if it takes Finn a fortnight to return. With that, Cucullin sat next to Finn's cradle and rocked it, somewhat roughly as giants will do, and hummed a soothing giant lullaby. Poor Finn saw his very life pass before his eyes. Oh, me bones! What is wrong with the child? asked Cucullin. Um, uh, the poor lad is teething, said Una. His gums have been smarting lately. There's nothing that can be done. I'm not so sure of that, said Cucullin. Me own dear mither had a little trick she used when me choppers come up. With that, Cucullin reached for the flask of spirits he kept in his hip pocket. He poured a touch upon the little finger of his right hand and opened Finn's mouth with his left. Then he massaged Finn's gums with a spirit-soaked finger. The spirits will dull the boy's pain, said he. Now it was bad enough to have Cucullin in one's house, but to sit back and take his little finger in the mouth was unpardonable. No, just a little bit more, laddie. Ah, said Cucullin as he lovingly administered another dose. You know, Mrs. McCool, I think after I've made your husband's acquaintance, I will take a wife so that I may have a son just like yours. It's the teeth way in the back of his mouth that are the worst, said Una. You're such a help kind man. And at that moment, Una decided to take matters into her own hands. She grabbed the pot that hung in the hearth, and rearing back, she hurled it at the head of the giant with all her might. Instead of Cucullin, however, the pot struck poor Finn dead upon the crown. The concussion was so great that Finn clamped down upon Cucullin's little finger, which was still applying the spirits, lopping it off at the third knuckle. Ah! 
Look what the boy has done to me! Cucullin groaned, holding his maimed right hand. I'm finished! You see, the giant's huge strength all lay in the very little finger of his right hand, which Finn had accidentally separated from its master. Cucullin then let loose with another ear-shattering scream. Then right before the eyes of Finn and Una, he shrunk from the size of a giant to that of a timid little church mouse. Now, Una and Finn had a large tomcat who liked to sleep behind the stove. But all the commotion woke him, and when he came out to investigate, there stood the oddest-looking mouse he had ever seen. Without much ado, the tomcat chased the screaming former giant down Knockmany, around the locks, and across the fields right into the sea. Glory be, said Finn in triumph. There isn't a giant in all of air as great as myself. I have defeated the great Cucullin. Una picked up her newly dented pot and gazed meaningfully into her dear husband's eyes. Er, uh, or perhaps should I say, we have defeated the great Cucullin. And truer words were never spoken. <laughs> in. Settle back. It's curtain time at the Story Lane Theater. You've never seen a stage like this one. Anything can happen here.
Today we're going to hear about a legend, the legend of John Henry. The story of this steel driving man has been passed down mainly in a song. The song has been around for over a hundred years, and it changes a little every time someone new sings it. But it's always about a remarkably strong man and his race against a machine. We are going to hear two versions of that song today, performed in the style of music known as the blues. One from a musician named B.B. King, and the other from the man who's playing the music you're hearing right now, Taj Mahal. Taj has been playing the blues for practically his whole life. Let's hear what he has to say about his music and the legend of John Henry. The blues can express many moods and feelings. 360 degrees of emotion. Joy, sadness, fun, laughter, all kinds of things. It has the ability to take whatever life is and present it in a way that you hear it right away. There are some songs that came out of railroad work. That was a, a, a really hard job. You think about laying, you think about laying railroad track and ties and that they used to do all that work by hand. That was all done by hand. Chanting rhythmically while you're doing that kind of work makes it go easier. The sun was hot, the work had to be done, and the freedom that they had was to rhythmically deal with this. That's something that they could do. So they sang their songs and the work goes much easier. The first time I heard The Legend of John Henry, I cannot even recall. It was so long ago that I know it was before the age of five. That much I can tell you. But it came out of the folklore that was always being brought down the line. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to play that song. It's a very important song. When John Henry was a baby boy Sitting on his daddy's knee Daddy said, son, son, son Keep on looking to the sun Don't you ever take no pattern after me Don't you never take no pattern after me John Henry actually takes uh, an incident that happened out near Beckley, West Virginia, around the building of the Big Bend Tunnel for the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. There was a race to see whether the man would hold up as good as the steam drill. John Henry, he said to the steam drill, steam drill, I'm gonna run you down. I'm hitting nine pounds from my hips on down. No more you go watch me throw down. No more watch me throw it down. John Henry is the struggle between humans and the machine. There's always the desire to show that the human touch is more important than the mechanical touch. Henry hammered in the mountains to the head of his hammer called fly. I've been picking my boys, won't you lay them down again? I want one cool drink of water before I die. One cool drink of water before I die. One cool drink of water before I die. Legends are started out because of people's desire to have hope. It usually is some sort of unique incident that happens, and then a lot of different people put their own little spin on it. In my opinion, what John Henry symbolized was uh, endurance and strength to really come up against a, a formidable, a very formidable uh, foe and triumph. Thanks, Taj, for playing your version of the song. And now, let's get ready to see the legend of John Henry. Be sure to listen for another version of the John Henry song by B.B. King, and you'll see how the legend of John Henry keeps right on growing all the time. One day I find myself out on 
good while ago, when the United States was still busting out of his baby shoes, there lived a man named John Henry. Now, ain't no history books gonna tell you about John Henry, because he was just too plain big for them books. But when it comes right down to it, John Henry was the mightiest, doggone greatest nation builder this country's ever seen. Oh, sure, you had your Washingtons and your Jeffersons, but they was just presidents. You see, John Henry was a steel-driving man. Now, some folks think they know all about John Henry and his famous race with the steam drill, but most of them don't even know a steel steak from a beefsteak. See, I was around when John Henry was king of the railroad camps. And I remember him just as clear as the Kentucky moon on an August night. So y'all listen up, because I'm going to tell you the guaranteed, gold-plated, 99.9% .9 truth about John Henry. Now, it all started in a little village way down south in cotton country. Mama and Papa Henry were just your ordinary sharecropping folk, no different from the rest of us. They lived in a log cabin and... One springtime morning, Mama Henry gave birth to a baby named John Henry. Now, folks knew right away there was something different about John Henry. <laughs> Shoot, ain't no ordinary baby born with a hammer in his hand. And ain't no ordinary baby weighs over 45 pounds. But John Henry did, and that wasn't even the strange part. Not two hours out of his mama's belly, John Henry ups and starts talking. Oh, if it ain't too much trouble, he said, just as sweet as sugar. Would y'all mind bringing me something to eat? I'm mighty hungry. Now, nobody ever heard a two-hour-old baby talking before. But after a while, Mama Henry asked John Henry what he wanted to eat. Well, he said, figuring and calculating on his fingers, I'd like eight ham bones, uh, two pots of black-eyed peas, a three-foot slab of cornbread, a three kettles of cabbage soup, a big heap of collard greens, four pans of peach cobbler, and, and two pots of coffee, strong coffee. Uh, that is, if it ain't too much bother. So John Henry ate pretty good. And he was so tuckered out when he was done by Jiminy, he slept for a solid week. Well, the years went by, and John Henry grew bigger. At two years old, he was juggling chickens for fun. At six, he was wrestling with razorback hogs and juggling chickens at the same time. And at ten, why at ten, John Henry was already a teenager. But there was nothing in the whole wide world that John Henry liked more than swinging a hammer and singing a song. He'd hammer hickory sticks. He'd hammer fence posts, cooking pots, brass nails, boulders, anything he could get his hands on. He'd pound in the morning, clang in the evening. His arms grew as solid as oak stumps and his chest busted out bigger than a barrel. Why, he grew so big that one day he couldn't even fit through the front door of his parents' cabin. And that's when John Henry decided it was time to leave home. Mama, he said one morning, I'm a man now. I'm a natural man. And I'm going to find me a job with a hammer in my hand. So John Henry left home, and he walked north through the countryside. And as the sun went down at night, making the whole land light up like fire, he sang a song to himself. Yeah, my name's John Henry, and I'm a natural man. I was born one morning with a hammer in my hand. And if one day I find myself out all alone, I'll hammer till the evening Found my way back home 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 
One afternoon, while he was walking in the lonesome woods, he stumbled across a road of iron rails. Those rails sparkled in the sunshine like silver. And beneath them was freshly cut wood ties, which smelled sweeter than a bag of balsam. And John Henry exclaimed, to no one in particular, By Jiminy, if this ain't a railroad track, then I'm an ox and a moron both at the same time. Now John Henry, who was no ox and certainly no moron, was correct in his assessment. He had in fact stumbled onto the Great Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad line, which was just being built around that time. The C&O line, as people like to call it, was going to connect up the eastern with the midwestern part of the United States. The railroad cut through some of the deepest, darkest, most howling wilderness of West Virginia, along hills and hollers, up mountains and down valleys, through woods as thick as a cornfield in cutting time. Well, John Henry knew right away he was on to something big. And after a day of following those rails, he reached the top of a rise. And from that rise, he saw where the tracks ended, far in the valley, and a whole assembly of men were living and working. From up there, he could hear the clang and clink of hammers hitting steel stakes. And to John Henry, it was the sound of heaven itself. A beautiful harmony of hammers ringing over the hills like, like songbirds in early spring. Now that's a job for me, John Henry yelled, beaming from ear to ear. A job for a natural man who wants to build this land with a hammer in his hand. With that, John Henry scrambled down that rise as fast as his feet could take him. And when he got to camp, he was amazed. It was like nothing he had ever seen before. There were men from all over the world working together with hammers. There were black men and brown men and red men. There were yellow men and white men too. So when John Henry got to camp, he just pushed his way straight ahead to the end of the line, picked up a nine pound hammer and started driving steel stakes like it was going out of style. Clang, hitting here. Bang, hitting there. Ding, hitting this one. Dang, hitting that one. Well, after a while, everyone on that line stopped what they was doing and started looking at this rather large, enthusiastic stranger. They saw right away that John Henry was just the naturalest man they had ever laid eyes on. Why, he hammered those stakes so hard that smoke rose from them, and some of them even caught fire. Soon the captain came over and started watching John Henry too. Son, he said after a while, you the darn crackest steel driving man I ever seen. Name's Captain Tom, and I'd be honored if you'd work for me starting tomorrow. John Henry put down his hammer and smiled. Pleased to meet you, Captain Tom. My whole life I've been waiting to build this land with a hammer in my hand, and I don't aim on waiting any longer. If it ain't any bother to y'all, I'm going to start right now. And with that, John Henry set straight to work on the C&O Railroad. Now, driving steel ain't no 4th of July picnic. Usually it takes a team of three men, all working in rhythm, to knock one stake into the ground. And usually there's a man called a shaker who has to hold the steel in place while it's being hit. But John Henry had his own way of doing things. First, he had the blacksmith build him two 40-pound hammers, which most men couldn't even lift. He'd hold one hammer in each hand like a pair of drumsticks. Then he'd take a steel stake, hurl it into the ground as if he was playing darts and smash it down with one hammer and then the next. Bing, bang, boom. The whole time just singing a hammer song. The fact is, John Henry couldn't really hammer without singing and vice versa. Cause for him, singing and hammering was just different parts of the same thing. Yeah, my name's John Henry. I'm a natural man. Well, I was born one morning. With a hammer in my hand And if one day I find Myself out all alone I'll hammer till the evening And found my way back home And found my way back home Found my way back home 
Well, John Henry got so good at driving that steel, he could do the work of ten men in half the time. He could hammer upside down, underarm, overarm, backhanded, blindfolded, sideways, frontways, and a few ways so complicated they can't even be explained without an acre of blackboards and a barrel of chalk. Heck, he worked so fast that he needed his own waterman just to keep his hammers from catching fire. And when he drove steel, people 300 miles away could feel the earth jump. So John Henry worked that line, and he was happy as a boll weevil in a cotton ball. Sometimes he'd ramble around the country months at a time, laying line all over the land. Why, John Henry laid more line than any other man living or dead before or since. Well, one day in late summer, when John Henry was back working the C&O line, right around Big Bend Mountain, a stranger came into camp. Now, this stranger was all duded up and dressed to the nines, a real city slicker who worked for none other than Cornelius Vanderbilt. Now, this fella brought with him a big contraption which nobody had ever seen before. It was made of six kinds of steel and covered with dials and gauges and drills and hammers. Ah, uh, this here machine is called a steam drill, the stranger explained when he got into camp. And it can drive steel five times faster than any man. Now, this fellow wasn't making no friends by saying a thing like that, because nobody likes thinking a piece of metal can do their job. But them folks got to scratching their heads, looking over that machine and figuring that maybe, just maybe, it could. So them folks grew mighty quiet about the mouth. And just when things got so silent you could hear a ladybug yawn, well, John Henry stepped forward. I'll die with a hammer in my hand for any machine beats a man. He said it straight out with no bragging assassin. Then he went on. A man's a man. And there ain't no machine that's better than a man. A man's got a heart inside, a big old beaten heart. But a machine ain't got nothing but a soul of cold steel. On hearing this, those folks nodded in agreement. But the stranger smiled and there was a glint of gold in his eye. Does that mean you're willing to compete with my steam drill to see who can drive more steel? He asked. If that's what I got to do, John Henry said, I'll do it, because I'm a natural man. And so the contest was set for two days away at 9 o'clock in the morning. John Henry versus the steam drill. And won't you know it, two days later, just as the sun was stealing up over Big Bend Mountain, folks came from all over the land, came streaming into that valley. They came by foot, by horse, by buggy, and by locomotive train itself just to see John Henry whoop up on that steam drill. At nine o'clock, the crowd fell silent, and the official man shot his gun into the air. The contest had begun. On the right side was the steam drill, and that steam drill straight away lurched into the lead of gurgling and a spouting and making metal racket to high heaven. There were fellas shoveling pine knots in its belly for fuel, and that machine was drilling holes into the ground just as fast as buckshot. On the left side was John Henry, sweating and flexing and letting loose with full John Henry force. Clang, hitting here. Bang, hitting there. The whole time singing his song while his hammers kept a backbeat. way the hours went by. One hour, two hours, three, four, five hours. The sun climbed high up in the sky, then rolled back down. And John Henry's hammers got so hot, they were just glowing like the sun itself. But that steam drill was still ahead. clock that afternoon, John Henry and the steam drill were neck and neck. 
they reached the opening of Big Bend Tunnel and went right inside. Folks waited outside where they could hear the contest going on. They heard the whine and screech of that steam drill, spitting and screaming like an alley cat. And over that awful sound, they could hear John Henry's voice, sweeter than the summer's corn, echoing out of that tunnel. Yeah, my name's John Henry. I'm a born a natural man. I was born in the morning with a hammer in my hand. With these hammers of steel, I can whip any steam drill. At five o'clock, just as the day was cooling down, there was another gunshot. Race had ended. All was silent in Big Bend Tunnel. Outside, a hush came over the crowds, and that valley was as quiet as a juke joint on Sunday morning. After a few minutes, the official man came walking out of the tunnel. He strode right down those tracks, held his hand up high, and yelled out, John Henry drove more steel than the steam drill. John Henry beat the machine. And who? Boy, you should have heard that crowd explode into yipping and yelling and screaming. Just as pleased as Plum Pudding that John Henry had won. Folks was a celebrating and folks was a dancing. John Henry came out of that tunnel, covered from head to toe in coal dust, coughing and holding his gut as if something had bust inside. So the crowds hushed again, and John Henry laid himself on the ground. <coughs> you have to forgive me, folks, he said, but I had to beat that steam drill, and I did. And now I'm going to my grave with a hammer in my hand. Well, nobody can believe what they was hearing. Why, John Henry just whooped that steam drill. But as he was laying there with his hammers crossed over his heart and his face covered in coal dust, John Henry upped and died. Up and died died right there in front of all those folks as the sun was going down for the night. Now some folks say John Henry died of a broken heart because he knew the steam drill one day would take the place of every steel driving man in the land. Others say he died of breathing too much coal dust. Well it turns out John Henry didn't really die at all. He just sort of went on a long, deep sleep from which he hasn't yet woken. And if you don't believe me, shoot, you can see for yourself. Now all you gotta do is take a train, any train, out into the empty countryside. And in the evening or late at night, when the moon is big and fat and the wind is just right, you listen to the wheels chugging on the track. the beat of a drill. And by Jiminy, that's the sound of John Henry pounding steel stakes till kingdom come. Yes sir, we folks, that's the sound of John Henry hammering his way back home. <laughs>